So uh, 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 I will introduce Dr. Islam. So uh, Dr. Islam uh, has been uh, in the Institute for Quantum Computing since 2016 as an assistant professor with the Department of Physics and Astronomy in the Faculty of Science and is also the principal investigator in the Laboratory for Quantum Information with Trapped Ions. Uh, his research interests are in quantum information processing, in particular quantum simulation and computation. Uh, computation. And uh, he did his uh, PhD with uh, Professor Chris Monroe's group at uh, University of Maryland College Park. And he was subsequently a postdoc with Professor Greiner's group at Harvard and Professor Buletish group at MIT. And uh, uh, after uh, the uh, postdoc at MIT, he has joined uh, as his assistant professor at the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, so I uh, set the stage open uh, to Dr. Islam, and uh, you know uh, he can continue with his uh, presentation. Thank you. Let me share. Yes. Okay. Um, so can you remind me of the time here? We are a little bit late here. So how long do I have? Yeah, I think you still have 50 minutes, it's fine. Okay, okay. okay. thank you. All right, uh, thank you everyone. Thanks for inviting me. And especially I'd like to thank all the organizers for putting together this uh, wonderful conference in these very challenging times worldwide, but specifically in India nowadays. And um, so today I'm going to talk about trapped iron quantum simulation. Uh, throughout this, uh, the school and the discussion session, you have heard a few talks on trapped ions on from various aspects. So I will focus on quantum information processing, uh, especially quantum simulation of spin models. So uh, before I start, I want to show and uh, acknowledge my research team at the University of Waterloo Institute for Quantum Computing. Yeah. And uh, pretty much all the work I'm going to show here, they came from um, these uh, very talented postdocs and students. Uh, of course, this was before pandemic, when we could still go outdoors. You see the beautiful Niagara River in the background, and this is now. So uh, I think we all are introduced by now on the basic concept of quantum simulation, but this is my one slide summary. We, uh, if we want to understand the properties of many body quantum systems, we know that that is hard. And especially because of properties like you know, non classical correlations between different parts of your quantum systems, that is entanglement. And in general, the Hilbert space that we have to uh, take into account if we are trying to compute properties of a general quantum many body system that grows exponentially. For example, if you have in two level systems or spin, system, spin half systems or qubits in the context of quantum computing, then the Hilbert space grows as two to the n. And if n is of the order, you know, more than a few dozens, this is already a pretty large number. In 1982, Feynman uh, actually asked this question, can physics be simulated by a universal computer? And he argued that if we build the computer itself, out of quantum mechanical elements, then uh, maybe natively the computer understands the laws of quantum physics. So we don't have to deal with encoding this exponential Hilbert space on our classical resources. And of course, between 1982 and now there have been many technical developments. There are many experimental groups now trying to realize a quantum computer. We don't have a digital quantum computer yet but we do have some small scale quantum computers and quantum simulators. So coming to quantum simulation, what are the kinds of problems that we are trying to address? Like a very fundamental physics E problem would be, uh, let's say we know about uh, the macroscopic properties of a many body system. And that could be your high temperature superconductor, or that could be you know, this quark gluon plasma that's created inside a high energy reaction collider. And as physicists, we'd like to describe or we'd like to understand this system from fundamental principles and we'd like to write down the minimal uh, model or minimal interaction between the constituents between atoms or between electrons at a fundamental level so that we can expect these macroscopic properties. And that is hard to do on a normal computer or a classical computer precisely because of uh, this exponential Hilbert, Hilbert space and so on. 
So a quantum simulator um, is essentially a system, an experimental quantum system, well-controlled experimental quantum system that you can use to get some of these answers. Exactly what is the killer application for a quantum simulation? People are still debating, and this is itself a hot field of research. Um, but I have listed a few that are often talked about. For example, understanding and optimizing chemical reactions. We uh, heard about uh, some of that in the previous talk. And uh, a very specific example that some people started uh, investigating is uh, the, if we can make our uh, you know, nitrogen fixation problem, which is central to, let's say, creating high quality um, fertilizers, if we can understand that process better and make it even more efficient, right? Wouldn't that be nice? And that would be a, a strong impact to the society as a whole. Or more fundamentally, if we want to understand the phase diagram of a many body Hamiltonian, which doesn't have to be a condensed matter Hamiltonian, it could also be in high energy physics. For example, this quantum chromodynamics Hamiltonian, where computation becomes very challenging. So the question is whether we can use a quantum simulator to understand some of those and, uh, and then perhaps predict new materials, new battery and new reaction mechanisms and so on and so forth. So that's by one slide motivation for quantum simulation. And how do we do that? So as I said, quantum simulator essentially is a very well controlled quantum system. And that quantum system could be trapped ions, could be atoms and molecules and Rydbergs. And you have heard about various systems throughout this talk. So this is a simple example. Let's say I have an ion trap and inside the ion trap we have individual ions. So these blobs of light are single atomic ions. They are cooled at, by laser cooling technique close to the an absolute zero temperature, sub millikelvin, micro Kelvin temperature range. And therefore they are very quiet, um, mechanically speaking. And then you can look at the internal structure of these ions and you can pick a couple of energy states that you find convenient to work with in the laboratory and you can encode your quantum information in those states. So those would be the qubit states or the spin states. And then these, ions or these qubits now, they are interacting with each other. And I'll spend uh, quite a bit of time in this talk to talk about that interaction so that you can essentially simulate a Hamiltonian that you're interested. I mean, just, just an example, let's say uh, this quantum Ising model, which uh, describes many uh, few body or many body physics phenomena like quantum phase transitions and all. So let's see you are interested. So what you do instead of encoding this Hamiltonian on a classical computer on classical bits, you essentially um, uh, do something to your system, control your system so that the Hamiltonian that is governing the system is this Hamiltonian that you are interested in. And then you let the system evolve. And when the system evolves, you don't have to think, worry about um, quantum laws of physics because the system natively understands quantum laws. Right? So it evolves according to quantum time evolution. And at some point, when you are done with the experiment, you want to read off the state and you want to read off what's the answer. The answer, the question could be, what is the minimum energy configuration of the spins? What, is the co what are the correlation functions and so on and so forth? So in these atomic systems, uh, using a lot of progress over the last you know, half a century on laser physics and atomic physics, uh, what you can do is you can turn on a specific laser light such that if the qubit or the spin is in up state, then it actually emits light, fluorescence. If it's in down state, it does not. And as a result, you can, after you know your simulation is done, experiment is done, you can basically send light and take a snapshot, just a picture within uh, sub milliseconds. And you might have a picture like this. So you have your iron in up, down, up, down, up, down, which tells you that in this particular example, the state that the system is showing is an antiferromagnetic state. Of course, there are lots of details here, but this is kind of how quantum simulations are done. Um, so there are different ways of doing quantum simulation. Uh, one can, so it goes by the name of analog simulation or digital simulation. So the idea here is, let's say you want to understand this Hamiltonian H, which could be this transverse Ising model. And if, you're, if you have enough control over your experimental system such that you can fine tune your system 
and the Hamiltonian of the system is exactly or within a very good approximation the Hamiltonian that you are interested in then you have basically solved your problem right then um, then you know that's the Hamiltonian you want to study you let the system evolve from some initial state and then you read off at some final state so this is what we call analog quantum simulator sometimes it might be experimentally very challenging to uh, to get to the Hamiltonian that you want because you may realize that you need a lot of controls and you don't necessarily have those controls so in those cases you can follow a digital quantum simulation model so in a digital quantum simulation model what you do is instead of simulating the Hamiltonian in real time what you uh, are interested in is simulating the unitary time evolution at discrete time intervals and in order to realize that unitary time evolution e to the minus i this is your Hamiltonian multiplied by time you actually break that Hamiltonian down or break that unitary evolution down into smaller pieces called quantum logic gates right so this could be your one qubit two three four five five spins or five qubits and at various time intervals you turn on two qubit logic gates or one qubit logic gate and uh, if you do it properly you have good timing resolution and you know overall coherence of your system then the system still evolves according to the Hamiltonian that you are interested in as I will show briefly in this talk that there is a huge middle ground that's largely unexplored which is a hybrid quantum simulation where you take pieces of analog quantum simulation and then combine that with digital some digitization and that could be very powerful and my final slide in this section is because we don't yet have a large-scale fully error corrected quantum computer various technology platforms are used to build the special purpose quantum machines or quantum simulators and I'll be focusing on trapped ions but we have heard about some other platforms for example Rydberg atoms you can do lots of quantum simulation neutral atoms could be bosons or fermions in optical lattices and now you know people are bringing in molecules uh, superconducting systems photonic networks defects in diamonds and the list is going on and on so um, I will stop, I will pause here and I will see if there are questions on the basic idea of quantum simulation. Yeah, uh, I don't think uh, there's, okay, there's one question here. Uh, so it's from Anshuman and he's asking, uh, how does one suppress uh, with any unwanted random interactions that may get added to the Hamiltonian? Yes, yeah, so that is indeed um, a very interesting question, an important question. So I would I actually have several slides on that. So I'll just I'll just um, so if you can wait for uh, maybe ten minutes or so, uh, I'll get to that. But indeed, that's an important question. And, and in a nutshell, the problem is a control problem, right? So and that control problem could be an optimization problem, how you are exactly simulating the Hamiltonian, but it's a control problem. I'll get to that. Okay. Oh, okay. I think there are Thank no you. further questions. Uh, you may continue. Yeah. So uh, this is roughly the outline of the talk. I would, uh, I'm an experimentalist and I like to show pictures. So even though you have uh, listened to a few ion talks, I will show some more pictures, ion trapping in uh, pictures, and then I'll describe the trapped ion platform for quantum simulation and talk about a little bit about this analog control uh, and uh, hybrid simulation. And, uh, and then I'll I'll briefly mention about some recent work from our group where we focus on a very important technical challenge in our field, uh, which is individual addressing of uh, ions. And, uh, and then I'll conclude with advertising an open access quantum computing facility that we are building at Waterloo that some of you may be able to use in the future. All right, so when you say ion trap, and you have seen several pictures in previous talks here as well, uh, basically this is you know, a bunch of electrodes and you apply voltages, um, like static voltage but also radio frequency voltages and that and those voltages create a confining potential near the center so here you see these rods these are tungsten rods about half a millimeter in diameter and this whole system is dipped into a, a vacuum chamber inside the vacuum chamber we put you know there's a there's a rod here you can kind of see with a little bit opening and, and inside the rod you um, uh, you put some material the the atom that you are interested in in our case we are trapping ytterbium which is a, a metal in solid form so there's a little bit of ytterbium here and then what you do is you turn you run current through the wire 
a few amp few amperes of current and that locally heats up because it's vacuum we don't actually heat up, you don't need to heat up it too much and then the atoms start coming out uh, from this nozzle and some of those atoms these are still neutral they are flowing going straight and some of them are crossing through this trapping region but they are still neutral so they don't see the voltages yet uh, at that point um, sorry uh, I, I, before I, I describe that so this is a picture of these rods and needles essentially so these are tungsten rods as i've said uh, as i have said and um, the this is a very simple ion trap structure of course there are more complex ion trap structures and we'll be using um, a, a version of this particular trap for another experiment made by sandia uh, sandia national laboratory here which has many electrodes and for creating a uh, vacuum you basically have to use all this vacuum technology that you have to use vacuum pumps and pressure gauges so uh, there is a lot of uh, expertise involved here so yeah let's come to this picture so you have your atoms flowing and then you send a laser uh, this laser photoionizes the the atom neutral atom it's a two-step photoionization and then photoionizes so now you have an ion and the moment you have an ion then the ion starts seeing the confining potential that you have created using the voltages but the ion still has uh, quite a bit of energy kinetic energy because it started from a very high temperature oven so now you send uh, simultaneously you send a laser cooling beam and laser cooling as you know there has been tremendous uh, progress in fundamental understanding of how you can use laser to cool atomic scale objects even mesoscopic objects nowadays and uh, if you turn on this laser cooling beam what happens is in like a second or a fraction of a second the temperature of the atom drops from a you know, few hundred degrees celsius uh, from its starting temperature to sub milli kelvin and then the atom doesn't have much kinetic energy and it gets trapped right here um, if you keep your photon ionization beam on and the atom keeps coming then you would actually see on a camera if you uh, if you point your imaging system towards the center you will see the light emitted by the by those atoms as they absorb uh, this laser cooling beam and you can image those and on your camera you'd actually see single atoms popping out so what you are seeing it's like a real-time video what you will see in the lab is like one one two three four the atom keeps popping up the ions and if you want to work with you know however many let's say you are doing an experiment with five ions so you just whenever you have five you just quickly switch off the photo ionization beam and then there's no more ion anymore you turn off your atomic oven and then you have these five ions these ions stay around for a really long time for example if you are interested in a single ion experiment that single ion in our trap stays for uh, months actually and um and you don't get lost because you don't lose those ions because the this whole system is in a very ultra high vacuum environment uh, is there any question on this how you trap ions and some pictures here yeah uh, no no question on that but uh, uh Saikath is asking about uh, the scaling for different systems you have mentioned uh different simulations analog and digital yeah uh Saikata, you want to ask your yourself yeah yeah i was asking about like the different systems you mentioned and like uh, which one is easier to scale a very simple question like yeah so but, so just to confirm by different systems you mean the analog simulator versus digital simulator versus hybrid right exactly exactly yeah 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 so actually the challenges the scaling challenges are are different in different sense so for example um if we actually if we just uh, hold on to that question for a few minutes because i have this whole section talking about that so i'll, I'll oh. come to that together with the that's right. okay okay so there's yeah. uh, one more question from nishant uh, which uh, yeah. is asking is the beam from the atomic oven directed towards the ion trap uh beam from the atomic oven like in the neutral atoms yes i think so yes yeah so we can do that we actually do that for diagnostic purposes but once you know, once everything is set up, then I don't need to look at the atomic beam anymore. But yes, absolutely, we can image the neutral uh, flux as well. It's a different transition, so you need a slightly different laser, but we have those, yeah. Okay, I think that's, that's all. Okay, yeah, thank you. All right, so now let's come to um, uh, the, I think the main part of my talk, which is 
how we can use the trapped iron platform for quantum simulation, but also answer these two questions that we, uh, we had. So uh, why do we use trapped ions for quantum simulation? There are you know, great features of trapped ions, but some of them that are very relevant is uh, coherence time. And um, you know, this recent paper uh, from Xinhua showed that you can uh, store quantum memory or you can you know, spin information, uh, quantum superposition inside a single ion for a really long time. I mean, think about this one hour uh, of quantum information storage on a single ion. However, it doesn't mean that you can do experiments for an hour, like a quantum experiment for an hour at a stretch. And the reason is the moment you turn on your laser beams um, to, uh, to create these Hamiltonians and you know, these quantum gates and all, what happens is the control noise. You know, so your laser beam, the power is fluctuating, the intensity is fluctuating, and, uh, and all of those control noise, that actually corrupts your memory, corrupts your qubit or spin systems or superposition. And then you will find that the uh, available coherence time actually reduces drastically to a matter of tens of milliseconds at most. But an important point here is the qubit is essentially perfect for trapped ions. And with the progress of technology, you know, the lasers are getting better and better over the years. Uh, the usable time over which you can actually do a quantum simulation experiment, that's also getting uh, longer and longer. Uh, all qubits are identical, unlike some uh, man-made qubits. You can use standard AMO techniques for uh, near perfect state initialization and detection of these quantum states that are useful for both computing and simulation. And you can have really impressive uh, fidelity for state detection and preparation errors. And finally, uh, trapped ions allow you to simulate various kinds of entangling operation or Hamiltonians with also very impressive uh, fidelity here. So now let's go to the heart of how we simulate a Hamiltonian with trapped ions. So here's a cotton experimental picture that you might adopt. You have this single ion, ytterbium in this case, and you have these two qubit states. So typically we take the two hyperfine states in the ground state manifold. There is an energy difference of about 12.6 gigahertz between those two. And um, let's say the simplest task you want to do, a coherent spin flip between down and up. So this is the so-called Rabi flop, right? Um, what you can do is shine two lasers. You now each of these laser, each of these lasers is detuned far, far away from an atomic transition, which is 2p half. So there is no spontaneous emission. However, you can control the frequency difference between the two lasers very precisely in your lab. And this frequency difference or the beat node frequency, which is the difference between these two laser beams, if that beat node frequency is tuned on resonance with the hyperfine transition, then you'd actually see a coherent Rabi flop between spin down and spin one or spin, spin down and spin up or zero or one, right? And those coherent Rabi flop, you know, it flops many, many, many times. It's a very coherent process. Uh, this data was taken at University of Maryland a long time back, not a recent data. But in effect, if you think from a quantum simulation point of view, uh, just like in the previous talk, where we talked um, of magnetic field, it's not a real magnetic field, but laser induced magnetic field, we are also simulating a laser induced magnetic field, right? Because what's happening here is your spin state is precessing and the rate of precession is controlled by the power in these laser beams. So effectively the Hamiltonian is some effective magnetic field, which is proportional to the laser power multiplied by a single spin operator. And this direction of the spin operator can further be controlled by choosing the phase of this peak node or the phase of this laser light, right? So this is how you simulate a magnetic field. If you're doing digital quantum computation, you want gates. A gate is nothing but applying, a single qubit gate is nothing but applying this Hamiltonian for a very specific time. For example, you apply it for, you know, just the pi by two time, where the probability of up and down is half, and you have essentially created a so-called Hadamard gate. Okay. Now, if you want to do any useful quantum simulation or quantum computation, then you want to create two qubit gates or spin-spin interaction. And that's the, uh, I think the most fun part of this many body system. So how you do, how do you do that? Uh, whenever you want to create a two particle interaction, you are looking for a way for the two particle to talk to each other. 
even though these ions are you know, well they're ions they have coulomb interaction but the coulomb interaction itself is not very useful because you cannot turn the coulomb interaction off however what you can do is you can uh, couple the internal spin states conditionally to that coulomb interaction so the way it works is let's say you have these uh, two ions that you want to uh, interact with each other you send a laser beam this is a very cartoon picture by the way you send a laser beam and the frequency of that laser beam you tune to this qubit frequency at which the spins flip uh, plus a vibrational quantum motion so this vibration because these are charged particles in a chain if one starts vibrating another one starts vibrating right? they vibrate in these normal modes and um, and that means now the whole system is vibrating and this ion even though it hasn't seen a laser beam yet and its spin state is untouched but its motional state is changed so now you can conditionally flip that second spin by actually sending another laser beam where the frequency is the qubit frequency minus the vibration frequency so as you can see that if you did not flip the first spin you would not have this phonon to start with and the second spin will not flip so this essentially is uh, how you entangle the internal state of two spins and this goes by the name of momer sorensen interaction which um, you know there's a list of different schemes starting with Sirac and Zolar from 1995 where they proposed the way of this way of uh, making spins interact ion spins interact with each other and in effect if you write down in all the terms in the Hamiltonian uh, then you will see that the atomic Hamiltonian essentially boils down to uh, or approximates to very simple Hamiltonian that many of us love from our statistical physics courses, namely the Ising Hamiltonian. With an uh, interaction GIJ, and I will focus a lot on this interaction in the next few slides, uh, GIJ being you know, how the interaction between spin scale with system size. You can also play a, little, a few more uh, control, uh, play with some more control parameters to effectively create an XY Hamiltonian uh, which is xx plus yy or more complicated like xyz kind of Hamiltonian but the take the take home message from this slide is the ions they have you know they take part in common vibrational modes or phonon modes and using a laser mediated force you can couple the internal states to these common phonon modes and then you can make the ions interact with each other so uh, let's come to this question of jij and um, so the interaction between ion i and ion j what does it depend on well there's a long equation here um, without going into the detail here i'd like to point out that as you'd naively expect that the interaction will depend on how strongly i'm shining that laser on individual ions so that is encoded in this rabi frequency omega on ith ion which is essentially proportional to in this case the electric field of the laser field of the ith ion and then multiply that with the Rabi frequency on the jth ion. There's a bunch of fundamental constants, you know, uh, or fundamental constant, which is Planck's constant, the mass, and delta K is how much momentum kick the laser field is giving into your system, because you have to, you know, shake this whole system to vibrate, uh, to excite this phonon, the phonon modes, right? So this, this essentially sets a, a basic energy scale for the problem. And for iterbium, this is, uh, yeah, you know this energy scale is about 10 kilohertz multiplied by Planck's constant and then you have this term here where bik it's essentially the eigenvector component which tells you how each ion takes part in that particular normal mode the normal mode that you have excited using laser and mu is essentially the laser detuning which tells you how far away from a specific normal mode your laser beam is so um, so basically, just as an illustrative example, let's say you have a bunch of ions and you have two you know, big fat laser beams, they're shining evenly on all the ions. So you have all pairs of interactions happening simultaneously. If you tune the beat note frequency close to the center of mass mode, so in the transfer station, right? So center of mass mode means all the ions are moving together. And in that mode, there is really no concept of who is nearest neighbor and who is farthest neighbor because all the ions are taking part equally. When you translate that into the spin-spin interaction, you essentially get a very long range uh, spin model, almost an infinite range spin interaction. If you go to other modes, then you said the interaction between space actually changes according to the nature of the mode. For example, the second mode is a tilt mode where ions that are farthest apart from each other, you see they contribute the most to that particular normal mode. 
and therefore they interact with the strongest. So this is a very strange kind of interaction, but you can have control over the spin-spin interaction. And finally, a lot of recent experiments actually have focused on this particular region, which is what we call blue of the center of mass mode, where you can tune the interaction as a power law. And this exponent of the power law is also something that is a tunable, tunable quantity. Okay, so um, let me pause here and see if there are specific questions on this section. Yeah, I think uh, there are a couple of questions. One from the previous part uh, by Arif, and Arif is asking, uh, when you showed this picture of these trapped ions uh, getting trapped, uh, why were they appearing periodically one by one? Like, what was the reason for that? Because we are so so because we because you know new ions are arriving into the region, so that's just the loading process. So what's happening here is you have one ion, and then so it's sitting at the center of the trap, and then there is another neutral atom coming, and it gets photoionized, cools, and locally that ion when you know when it comes, it actually perturbs this other ion. For a moment, they actually melt in the sense that ions are not crystallized anymore. They're not very cold anymore. That's why you see the ion kind of vanish locally. That, that happens very quickly. And then the second ion comes here. And then you have two ions. And then more neutral atoms come here and ionize, and you have three ions and four ions and five ions. So that's how you see uh, coming here. OK. And there's uh, one question from Arnab. And he's asking, uh, so when you showed us this uh, slide about this uh, chain of ions which are vibrating, uh, yeah. So uh, he's asking whether these vibrations are going to heat up the trapped ion system. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a quite interesting question. The short answer is, in a, a short time scale, the answer is no, it will not heat up. Because when we say that we are exciting these vibrational modes, we are actually doing it coherently. So what we are creating, you have these ions, like a mechanical oscillator. And if you think from uh, like a mechanical harmonic oscillator point of view, essentially we are exciting a coherent state. And it's a it is a coherent superposition of phonon states uh, that we are exciting, right? However, if you wait for a really, really long time, what can happen is there are other effects. For example, there could be a stray electric field that is, you know, uh, adding a little bit energy, mechanical energy to the system, and then you might lose this coherence. But when we are actually running this experiment, simulating the spin-spin interaction, the phonons are excited and de-excited in a coherent fashion, so it's not heating. In that short uh, sir, uh, 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 let me ask the exact question what I'm trying to yeah. address. Actually, the, I was reading about the uh, cooling of the trapped uh, the atom through sidewind uh, and all other things. So there, yes. uh, if you have this, mecha uh, this mechanical frequency vibration, then you can't uh, take this atomic a cool atomic system to quantum level to do the quantum processing. So, and here I am seeing like uh, in this experiment, you are adding this vib phononic vibration to the system. So it's it looks like like something opposite to that. That's no. why so, so what you do is you use your sideband <coughs> cooling and other techniques to initialize the system to sufficiently low temperature. So let's say, you know, in typical experiments, you can initialize very close to the ground state energy of the harmonic oscillator. And then, okay, one thing you will notice is in my slide, all the laser beams that I have chosen, I have actually separated them from the phonon mode. So the x-axis is the phonon mode frequency. So you don't exactly drive the system on resonance with the phonon mode. You have a little bit of detuning. So what that does essentially is you don't keep exciting the phonon modes in an unbounded way, right? It, in the, if you think of a phase space picture, what happens is the phonons keep populating and then depopulating like in a coherent state loop phase space picture mm -hmm. and this whole thing can be actually done in a quantum coherent fashion so it is not heating during sideband cooling you are right you can actually use phonon mode to cool objects but there it's not done by just the coherent raman process you also mm -hmm. need a way to extract energy from the system and that is done by the spin reset process okay okay, okay. <clears throat> And uh, there's one question from uh, Saikath. He's asking, uh, is this like an SYK model where all interacts with all? Right. So the interaction is, is long range here. It's an all to all interaction. Uh, they are normally anti ferromagnetic, all to all interaction. Indeed, correct. Um, near the center of mass mode. And as I said, if you go farther away from the center of mass mode, what happens is you are also coupling other modes um, together with the center of mass mode. And um, and then this long, you know, the long range part of the interaction starts kind of canceling between different modes, 
and you have an effective power law decay. And in the limit where you go far, far away from all these modes, then you essentially reduce the coupling to uh, uh, like a dipole-dipole um, a interaction, which is one over R cubed, or dipole coupling, which is one over R cubed kind of coupling between ions. But yes, near the center of masses, it is indeed an all-to-all -all coupling. Right. Okay. And I think I'll take one final question from Sadiq. He's asking, uh, does the softening of the trap at the wings affect the imprinting of the model? Uh, I don't quite understand what is what does the wing mean here, Sadiq, if you can ask Yeah, hi. Yeah, no, it's just that if you look at your, uh, hi, if you look at your iron string, I mean, there is a certain, the, the distance between successive ions is going to be stretching. Now, when you are imprinting your interactions on this entire thing, I mean, maybe in the all to all, it's it's not really so obvious. I mean, it's so obvious, but do you expect it to actually make a difference? Yeah, it does actually. Yeah, that's that's a good observation. It does. So even in the all to all case, well, if, if it's completely all to all, then it does not. But for you know any detuning near the center of mass mode, you indeed see that because the ions are getting farther and farther away from the edge, the, the interaction for a uniform intensity actually goes down. So if you want to fix that, what you need is you need more control. You need a control to fix that, that what you call softening of GIJ by compensating you know, with more intensity at the ions. You need localized intensity control to essentially fix that problem. But oh. yes, it is a problem. Yeah. So you're going to tailor your light field in order to fix this thing. But um, that is right. I mean, in an all to all, that this may be possible. But if you have a, a slightly more complicated thing, it's going to be murder, right? It is going to be murder. So that gets me to my, gets me to my next, uh, next slide, yeah. unless there are other uh, Barney so I, uh, no, no, I think there are a few more questions, but uh, we can take them at the end if time permits. So you yeah. listen. Okay, thank you. Oh, thanks for all these questions. It's great to not just talk to my computer. Um, uh, okay, so uh, Sadi, to your uh, point. So um, like one natural extension from this idea that if you have a single, you know, global beam shining on all the ions close to a mode and you have all these different spin interaction, how far can we take this? Can we actually make the interaction fully programmable? So before I show you how we can potentially do, which will also uh, actually address some uh, Soikal's question before about scaling. But if we, um, before we go to how we do that, let's see what are the advantages. If we could control the interaction between arbitrary pairs of ions, that means even though the ions are arranged in a 1D chain, and that's because of the constraint of your ion trap, effectively, the interaction graph, which determines the physics of the spin system, that could be arbitrarily programmable. Okay, so for example, you can rewire the same system into a square lattice or the you know this Kagome lattice. Uh, of course, there are a different number of ions here, so you need to choose your right number of ions or whatever lattice you want. So the dimensionality, the concept of dimensionality, becomes something that is programmable. What do we need for that? So clearly having just a global beam will not do that because if you have a system of n ions you have n choose two pairwise interactions and if you're controlling all of them you roughly need n choose two which is in roughly order n square control parameters what are these n square control parameters let's see so again this is the picture of your uh, the same phonon mode spectrum so you have your center of mass mode and then the tilt mode and all the other modes so let's say I have, you know, this optical system, the cartoon of this optical system. First, uh, we showed, showed this in this paper from 2012. So you take one big fat laser beam, you split that laser beam into N, where N is the number of ions. And then further on each of these laser beam, each, so each laser beam goes to a single ion. And on each laser beam, you modulate the frequency of the laser to imprint multiple frequencies. Uh, and each frequency is closely tuned to one of the normal modes. So how many control parameters you got? You actually got n square control parameters because each laser sees its own individual light at different frequencies. And if you have control over each component, you basically have a Rabi frequency, which is no longer just a number for each ion, but it's a matrix. Okay, so n 
denotes how much power is going on to that sideband, which is tuned close to a specific normal mode, and I is the spatial index, right? So you need n choose two order parameters j i j, and you have n square control over Rabi frequency. So therefore, indeed, you can control this problem. You can um, uh, you you can find your target coupling matrix, right? And you can uh, not only compensate for you know this decay of the interactions from the edges, but also create these arbitrary couplings. In principle, yes. Now, challenges. Actually, of course, experimentally, as you can imagine, this is uh, quite a complicated optical setup, although we are beginning to actually engineer such systems now. But even before we go to the experimental realization, there is another fundamental uh, problem when we started looking into this is how to even find out what parameters we need here, right? So let me elaborate on that. This is this, this equation that you see here, Jij, it's, you know, it has this term, which is this Rabi frequency, so product of these two Rabi frequencies, and then all of these, you know, normal mode matrices and those constants that I mentioned before and the laser detunings. Let's say we keep all of this constant, and then this is your uh, control parameter, so it's a control problem. Um, and how do you find this control problem? If we know the laser parameters, if you know the Rabi frequencies, knowing the spin-spin interaction, at least calculating the spin-spin interaction is trivial, right? That's just this arithmetic, this equation. But if you want a target interaction pattern, which is let's say this Kagome lattice, and you want to predict what, how do you want to program your laser uh, intensities, all these n-square laser beams, um, so that you have your control Rabi frequency, that itself is a hard problem. In fact, this is a class of problem that appears in physics again and again. This is the so-called inverse problem. And the idea is one direction is very easy to calculate and verify, but the other direction is very hard to calculate and verify. Like some example would be, you take a bunch of electrodes and apply some voltages, and you can easily calculate what's the potential. But if I give you the reverse problem, I tell you, I, you know, I want exactly this kind of potential, and find out what voltages you need on these electrodes, that itself could be a complicated problem. Okay. And sometimes it requires non-linear optimization like here because Rabi frequency enters twice. So in this 2012 paper, we used just non-linear optimization and for a given uh, interaction graph, finding the laser parameters actually takes a long time like non-linear optimization, especially if you have a large system. So um, this is where machine learning comes to our help. And I think yesterday's lecture, uh, Professor Manish Mukherjee was talking about his use of machine learning here of, for classifying uh, classical data set. Here, this, pro this particular problem is also classical, right? So what we can do is we can take um, a spectrum of these Rabi frequencies or randomly chosen Rabi frequencies, and then we can generate fake data or synthetic data for what Rabi frequencies correspond to what Ising coupling. And we can do that as many times as you want, because this is just one line of code, right? You know, do it 100,000 times, millions of times. It doesn't take any computer time. Now you have a data set. And then we can train a neural network where your input are basically your um, target JIJ, and then output are these Rabi frequency matrices. But because you have so many examples, you can train this neural network and the neural network if properly trained will find out the relationship between these Rabi frequencies and the Ising coupling. Okay. Just like if you show the neural network, you know, a million pictures of different kinds of dogs or your handwriting, then it will figure out. Um, it will, it will, uh, next time you ask it for an unknown uh, image, it will figure out whether this is, you know, zero or one or five or it's dog or cat. It's the same kind of problem here. So we did that we uh, train the neural network and we find that, okay, I'm not gonna describe all these details here, but we indeed find that the neural network gets trained and, uh, and then we tested the neural network. So for example, we now asked my eight qubit, this is all theoretical, no experimental here. So we just asked my eight qubit system to mimic the triangular interaction. And within fraction of a millisecond, the neural network gave the answer. You should program your Rabi frequencies in precisely this fashion. That's the Rabi frequency matrix. This is ion index and this is the mode index. 
and then because we can verify with this Rabi frequency matrix what is the um, you know interaction, then we find that it's within one percent, and this actually scales exceptionally well with um, with what you want, right? So. So to summarize on this part, the analog uh, quantum simulation, you need, if you want full control, you actually need um, a lot of laser beams, right? So you need n square order parameters. So the scaling from that point of view is actually scales, just the control scaling, scales as the order parameter, uh, scales as the number of, you know, degrees of freedom number of ion square here. However, once you have fine tuned your system, then there is no more, um, digitization no more quantum gates and you have this hamiltonian which is could be you know an ising model or an xy model on a triangular lattice an interesting physics problem and then you just run this hamiltonian right so the, the again the difficulty of the analog simulation is really the control of all of that model uh, let me see if there, there are any questions here on this analog part Yeah, so far I don't see any question. So one question I wanted to ask myself is uh, uh, in, in this uh, top right hand corner graph that I can see on the slide, uh, there's a very strong uh, negative Rabi uh, frequency, right? I can see that. Yeah. So, so how do you interpret that physically? Yeah, so negative Rabi frequency means you, so you know, remember, so Rabi frequency is coming from this um, two photon transition, like two laser beams. A negative Rabi frequency essentially is normal Rabi frequency but with a, with a phase flip on one of them. So what you do is you program the phase which is controlled by these RF modulators, you flip a phase pi and that essentially is a negative Rabi frequency. Right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Okay. And Saikat is asking uh, why does the algorithm convert so fast? Isn't it an NP complete problem? I am not sure if it's an NP complete problem for this classical case. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Like many machine learning things, you try various algorithms and sometimes it converts first. I do not have an intuition for why it does. I, only piece of intuition we could come up with is why this problem works so easily is because there is a scale invariance in this problem. What do you mean by that? The overall scale for like the actual energy scale for the couplings it's a constant here. You know, you can multiply all the Rabi frequencies by a constant term, and all you do is just scale up or down these couplings. And in this problem, we said that we are not interested in matching the absolute energy scale of the problem. We are interested in matching the pattern of the interaction. So therefore, the problem, the problem space, in some sense, basically simplifies drastically. Right? We are not distinguishing between different similar-looking pattern, but say different height, just a pattern. And we found that that itself leads to a huge simplification. Okay, how much time do I have? I think another four minutes. Okay, so I will quickly wrap up. Um, I'll just get two quick things and wrap up. Thank you. Thanks for all these questions. Sure. All right, so sure. I, I don't have too much detail here, but um, another um, promising direction, which you can read in our 2019, uh, it's a proposal paper, theory proposal paper. Instead of fine tuning your system like the analog quantum simulator um, you can also play some tricks go in between a fully digital quantum simulation where the scaling is quite horrible because you have to break down everything in terms of quantum gates in a single qubit and two qubit quantum gates and you're fully analog where you're doing a lot of fine tuning and the idea is um, you do a little bit of fine tuning to get to you know close to your target Hamiltonian and co close quote unquote depending on you know, how much capability you have a simple example would be let's say of this four qubit system and I want to simulate four qubit on a ring or a you know placket of a square lattice doesn't matter for four so that means if I tune if I have a global beam just like I have shown you a few slides back where um, all spins are interacting with each other you basically have this except you have one three and two four. So your task is to then is to do something that effectively cancels this one, three and two, four. You can do it at periodic intervals. So that's what I mean by hybrid. And the, the missing piece here uh, that you need, the added piece that you need other than this global interaction is a side dependent spin phase control, right? So this could be a side dependent AC start shift. And essentially intuitively, again, I'm not going to detail, but intuitively what you are doing is you are somehow isolating the bonds that you want to cancel. In this case, one, three and two, four. 
And if your Hamiltonian is less than this flip-flop Hamiltonian, as you evolve in time, each Jij in time actually picks up a phase. And if you gain control over those phases by essentially controlling the, the local magnetic field on site one and three, then you can do a lot of, you can adopt a lot of NMR techniques like, you know, Fourier Hamiltonian engineering and all to effectively cancel those interactions. So in summary, that section, what it means is instead of running continuous in time and fine tuning, you have your global Hamiltonian. In this particular example, we used, uh, you know, two global Hamiltonians, but global Hamiltonian and this, you know, this gradient and you turn them on and off in such a way that at discrete time intervals, your system is the target Hamiltonian. So Hamiltonian is the target Hamiltonian that you want, not at continuous time interval. So this is intermediate between the a full quantum gate where you are even creating uh, the spin-spin interaction, even that one, two, two, three into digital gate format and a fully analog. So that's what you call it hybrid. And the scaling here is you actually need uh, how many pulses you need per cycle. You actually need N pulses where N is the number of ions. Don't have time to go into detail, but happy to answer questions later on. Okay, the final thing, just in a couple of minutes, I wanna show uh, some recent results from our lab where we focus on this very central technical challenge, which is how you control, how do you control individual ions, right? If you have a normal computer, like your classical computer, you send some current or some signal essentially to address each memory cell on your, on your memory block. If you want to do the same thing with your trapped ion quantum processor, simulator or computer, you'd like to send lasers that are focused. Well, what's hard? Well, if you're an experimentalist opti optics person, you know what's hard. If you try to focus down a laser beam into a very tight spot, there are aberrations and that's, that kills everything, right? So you want a, let's say a green beam, ideal focus beam, but you have a very aberrated beam. So the, the, the trick here is to measure the ion, measure the aberration using the ion as a sensor. And we do that using a hologram technology. I'm not going into detail. Um, and, um, and the end result is after you have calibrated the aberration and compensated for it, you can actually get experimentally, you get really, really close to your ideal diffraction limited beam spot where, and this spot could be really tiny, like micron level spot here. And the phase front of the light is essentially perfect. Okay. And this you can read up on our, on our recent work here. So, um, and you can create, you know, multiple patterns. You can shine you know, two ions simultaneously or three ions simultaneously very precisely. Anyway, so that's pretty much my talk. And I want to flash one slide as, a, as an advertisement. I talked about challenges of quantum simulation. Now, most of the, you know, the, the task that I talked about here was just scientific, but there is also a social challenge. Let's say you want to try your ideas on a machine. Where did you find a quantum simulator? Well, there are some labs where these are operating, but often the social barrier is, you know, you write an email to those labs and the graduate students that try to understand what you're saying and then they will encode something. And this process takes you know, years, essentially. So at Waterloo, we are actually building, teaming up with Crystal Senko's team, an open access quantum computer that can be accessed remotely. And we are hoping that this machine will be operate uh, uh, online next year, where we give users access to various levels. Like if you are someone who is happy with just sending a circuit, you can already do that in some commercial, um, like IBM Q and all. But also if you're someone who is interested in, let's say, compiler, how you build a C0 gate out of more fundamental, these spin-spin interactions, or even more fundamental, how, to, how do you, you know, make a most robust pi pulse, for example, then you can do all of that using this machine, quantum mind. So stay tuned for this, and that's pretty much it. Uh, so uh, flash this slide, and thanks. Okay. Uh, so Rajibul, that was a wonderful uh, overview about your work. And I think uh, we are almost out of time, but there's one uh, question we can take from Sadiq. Uh, Sadiq, you want to ask a question? Yeah, so uh, just, um, I have a speculative question, but before that I have a philosophical problem, which is that we are now surrendering to machines in order to do quantum computation. And, uh, you know, it, the question is that whether we could equally well do it by human effort or do we have to surrender to machine in order to do this, um, you know, get your Rabi matrices and so on and so forth. And a bigger question is that let's say we, so a lot of quantum information processing, especially with iron traps, et cetera, is 
to do with scaling and scaling has been a big thing but there is also the thing of the decay of the uh, the fidelity as time passes so and i mean with increased scaling that problem also intensifies uh, much more so is there a point beyond which it is just not useful to start, to think about is there a natural limit to this yeah both are uh, very involved questions so answer your first question about uh, relying on machines yeah something i'm not also very comfortable however there are problems that are uh, very easy for you to verify and i don't think there is anything wrong with using machine learning techniques there for example here so the problem with machine learning is you know it's if you get an answer but you don't have a way of verifying whether that answer is correct or wrong then you are blindly dependent on some black box algorithm this is not the case here and this is the case for most actually many inverse problems that you may not find the most optimized solution out of your uh, this neural net but whatever solution you find it cannot be wrong because you can easily verify it so sure. that's the, so we are comfortable with that um i can't comment on more general philosophical question there but i think practically i'm okay with as long as i can verify uh second question is indeed very valid as you increase the uh, number of ions the control parameter scales up but also the coherence time scales down and this could be not 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 even as one over n but you know in some models could scale as one over n square so indeed there is a time at which you uh, beyond which you cannot scale it up using the way we do it now so looking forward i see two ways to get around it the i think the most important way would be to uh, even on the small systems make your operations as quiet as possible as perfect as possible so that you hit that error correction limit because if you do that then you have a logical qubit and then you basically get past this is not a problem of quantum computing itself it's harder but also classical computers have this problem right and but the class error correction is built into classical computers and therefore we can deal with this so um what what can we do to um, you know realistically if you ask me with all these nisc systems or small scale systems what's the best use of it uh, my honest answer would be to learn about these systems to the error so that you can make bigger systems and you can go to this error correction limit um but there is another technology specific answer to your question which is i also think cramming in many many more ions inside a trap is not a solution because what will happen is your normal mode will become like a forest of modes now and then even controlling those and we have all those unwanted couplings which i think there was a question earlier is going to be more and more challenging so perhaps the solution there is of a more modular architecture maybe there is an optimum number i don't know i'm guessing around you know 20 30 40 where you do everything within one local trap and then you build up interconnects between these traps those traps could be inside one vacuum system and that interconnect could be by some shuttling mechanism like physical movement mechanism or through a photonic switch or whatever and you build up entanglement here so i think these are the two directions that we'd like to push okay thanks thanks rajivul okay so i think uh, with that we have come to the end of this session and uh, i would like to thank all the speakers for this session and uh, hopefully we'll uh, continue our discussion tomorrow with the new set of speakers so sort of you want to add something here uh thank you i think everybody for the very nice talks i think shoykat has something to say so yeah, i just I think... have... go ahead i, I just have okay. a simple minded question rajibul I yeah think. this is regarding machine learning it's so hot and so uh, like uh, like uh, so around these days but like normally uh, like very simple minded for machine learning as an experimentalist i would always think that it's like this feedback where the machine is being trained through uh, you know pid kind of things uh, so i i would always expect in a machine learning there would be real time you know quantum feedback but it seems like something else is meant these days by machine learning and the same uh, with what you presented that it's kind of like there's a like you know i don't know whether this makes sense or whether so so i think people talk about uh, this quantum machine learning in very different contexts and there is one mm-hmm. where there's a real time quantum feedback and that real time means quantum coherence time so mm-hmm. uh, what i talked about and i i know i uh, you know a couple of lectures people mentioned machine learning in some other lectures too i think most of these are still everything classical there's nothing quantum happening here in the machine learning time however 
Let's say you want to do this experiment where you are actually changing the spin-spin interaction dynamically within one experiment. And you have 10 milliseconds at your disposal because you know, your system is very clean. If, let's say you want to go from this triangular lattice to a Kagome lattice for doing some interesting condensed matter experiment. If your machine can tell you how to program your system in sub millisecond, you can indeed make the, a train machine you can indeed make the trend machine part of your quantum loop. I think that's where a lot of real time, exactly. So then, you know, so you need your machine basically tells you exactly what's the parameter and you can even make it more complicated. Let's say you have your long chain of ions, you do some partial measurements on part of it. And depending on the outcome of that measurement, you say, I want to continue with a ferromagnetic coupling mm -hmm. or an anti-ferromagnetic coupling, all sorts of possibilities. I don't even know why you want to do that. And some condensed matter theorists will come up with the brilliant ideas of using oh, this. Absolutely. That makes sense, yeah. In real time, right. if one is making the coherence time, yeah. That's right, yeah. But the coherence time is getting bigger and bigger, which is nice because of technical improvements here. Yeah. Excellent talk, as you will. Thank you, and good to see so many of you. Hi, everyone in the yeah. Thank you, Rajul. <laughs> Very nice talk.